So uh, again, we welcome all of you to this event. Um, I'm going to actually get started with a few things um, in case Mike joins while we are um, while I'm talking. I want to be able to use his uh, connection to talk to you and not go over um, not go over uh, what's going um, what we're talking about and all the all the background noise and things like that. So okay. So first of all, I want to welcome you to this Polar Connect event. Um, we are hoping today to connect with the uh, research team that's down at the South Pole Station uh, right now. They've been at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. They are looking at the automatic weather stations uh, that are set up down there. Um, and they do a bunch of maintenance and they collect data from them. Today's presentation, um, if all goes well, we'll hear from our Polar Trek teacher, Mike Penn, and the research team. It's December 17th, 2018 in North America, and in Antarctica, it's December 18th. A few things before we get started. Um, if you have never used the Adobe platform, it is um, a little bit different than what you're probably used to. Uh, right now, the content will show up in the center of your screen. You should be hearing my voice um, coming through your audio system, whether you've joined us by phone or voice over IP. You can see that there's a list of participants on the far left side of your screen. Myself, Janet Warburton, and Judy Fonstock, we both work for Arcus and we'll be hosting this event. Um, we are listed as Arcus staff and Arcus staff too. So at any time, if you have questions, please type them in the public chat area at the bottom, including any technical questions. This event is being recorded and will be archived, and we will share it with you uh, when we are done um, and post it on the website. Another thing that will also be on the website uh, after today will be the PDF of Mike's presentation. We will post that regardless of whether we cancel this event um, or are we have any technical issues. So you at least have his content that he wanted to share with you. Um, and let's see. Um, at this time, um, and for this particular event, we're going to ask you to post all your questions in the public chat area. We won't do any live questions because of uh, the bandwidth issues and so forth that we have. It will be easier for us to relay the questions to Mike directly if and when he connects. Um, if you haven't done so already, it's always nice to know who's with us in a webinar. So please post your school or institution and who is with you and where you're uh, joining us from. So a little bit of background before um, we uh, wait some more to see if Mike joins us. Um, Mike is part of the Polar Trek program, and I see actually several Polar Trek uh, teachers um, and alumni that have joined us today with their students. It's a program that is uh, run by the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. We're a nonprofit um, that is based uh, primarily in Alaska, but we um, have professionals that work all across the United States, including Judy, who's in New Hampshire, and myself in Anchorage, Alaska. Our program is funded by the National Science Foundation, and the whole premise of Polar Trek is to place teachers and informal science educators with researchers that are doing work in the Arctic and the Antarctic for a hands-on field research experience. Uh, this year we have 12 teachers that are part of our group and most of them have been in uh, the Arctic and have already completed their experience. Um, Mike Penn is about to finish up his Antarctic experience. He was hoping to come home actually on the 20th here, but that may not happen because of weather. And we have another teacher, Kevin Dickerson, who's going to be leaving here in um, uh, a few weeks. So let's see, and I don't know if there's anybody from the research team that is online. Will you please let us know so that uh, we can um, point you out as well and introduce yourself in the introductions. 
Again, uh, with questions, I said you should type them in the chat box. Um, is anybody else having sound issues? Bridget Ward says there's sound. If you can't hear me, let me know. Can't hear me, let me know here. Okay. Um, anyway, the questions, we're just going to uh, just use this one um, feature where we're just uh, typing them in the chat box today. We won't do this part. Okay. Um, and so with that, we just are needing to stand by at this time. I do not know, I haven't heard any dings or anything that indicate to me that um, we have been joined by Mike or uh, anybody from South Pole. So, um, and I'm checking to see if I have, we have another off, um, off internet channel to see if I've heard anything from Mike. It does not look like it. So at this point, we kind of have to stand by and wait. Um, again, I'm looking to see if there's any research members that aren't at South Pole that have joined us um, online. So if you have joined us and you're a researcher, um, please let me know. So if you are having technical issues, um, please disconnect and reconnect. Hello? Hi, Janet. You just joined by Is that Mike? Yep, it's me. Lee and Excellent. I are here. Hi. Oh, hi. So, Mike, um, we're really excited that you're able to join. We actually have your um, team slide up. I already got started on all the background and everything, so we're ready to go whenever you are ready. So please uh, just introduce yourself. Let me give you a heads up on who's here. We have 28 different uh, sites that have joined us. We have a variety of students and age groups um, all the way from places like Lake Erie, an island on a lake in Lake Erie, all the way to Germany, um, an elementary school in your area, Mike, um, as well as um, some of your Polar Trek alumni and students have uh, joined. Um, so anyway, a nice variety and uh, they're standing by and they're saying hi and we're ready to get started when you are. So just cue me when you want to change slides and we'll, I'll ping you also for questions every now and then. Okay, um, so that picture you're looking at right now is the five of us from the team, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the guy on the far left is Lee Wellhouse, and he's sitting right next to me right now. And I guess I should tell you that we're at South Pole. Um, this was originally scheduled to be done back at McMurdo Station, but um, it took us eight days to get here to Pole, and now we're just sort of stuck at Pole. Um, the weather at McMurdo is really bad. The wind is up almost 50 miles an hour, so they won't be flying out of Pole today. We are waiting for a twin otter to go from McMurdo to here so that we can use it to go fly out to, to AWS called, what, Henry and Nico? Henry and Nico. And uh, as soon as that happens, we can do our jobs and then get back to McMurdo and I can go home. But until that happens, we're not going anywhere. So that's the end of our left. The guy next to him is Forbes. He's a grad student from undergraduate student. Undergraduate student sorry. Um, in engineering, and he's uh, working on all of our hardware. Maybe, would, can you describe that? Because you were exchanging technical emails like late last night. Absolutely. Uh, so Forbes is working on a project for us where we're building the new electronics core for our weather station. So it's the brains of the weather station. It, it takes all the various instruments and it measures them so we can, it measures the temperature, it measures the wind speed, wind direction from the actual instruments themselves, uh, stores it on board, and transmits it out uh, through a satellite link. So our hope is we'll be able to use that to have more accurate measurements going forward and more reliable measurements going forward than our current setup, which is something we buy just commercially that's not really built primarily for um, the polar regions. 
So yeah. yeah, and so Forbes spends lots of his time in our lab back in McMurdo. He has gotten to go out into the field a time or two, and I think he's on the list to fly out, but the weather's been so bad that nobody's gone anywhere. Um, the next person is Elena um, Valkanen. She is from Finland, but she goes to the University of Colorado, Colorado in Boulder, in Boulder, right, where she is a PhD candidate. I guess did I say that right? Yeah, she, she's a yeah, she's a PhD student uh, for the uh, one of the primary investigators on our project. Uh, we collaborate between uh, Madison and Colorado, and she actually usually works on. Arctic work, um, but since she was given the opportunity to come down here, and she was very excited to take it, so we, so she's been helping us out. And the last person there is Dave Mikulajic, and uh, he also comes to the University of Wisconsin, like uh, Lee does, and uh, see his job similar to yours. Although you're the you're the big cheese around here, right? <laughs> yeah, I. I uh, generally run the field deployments and the electronic side of things. Dave uh, also will come down and when he's uh, by himself in the field or with a few other people, he runs things, but when I'm around, I take over and help run the logistics side of things for him. He also is working on uh, his, or he will be working on his master's shortly, so he'll start being a graduate soon, graduate student soon. And he uh, also does the quality control side of our work. So he takes the data and makes sure it's in good shape, that there aren't any issues with it, that it uh, doesn't have any problems. Because anytime you're getting data from the field, there, there can be some issues with it where things don't quite work out. That's part of the reason why we're hoping that you get better electronic scores. So he can spend less of his time on that and more time on research. So are you still there just so we're not just talking to nobody? Uh, we are yes, still we here. Are. And it, yeah, and you're coming in great. We hear you re really loud and clear. Good. I think I, I should remember to check that every now and then just so we're not sitting here talking for 10 minutes and <laughs> nobody's on the other end. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, so the next picture um, is just me. That's not that exciting, so we can go to the next one. Uh, that's Lee. We had just gotten off the plane um, uh, at McMurdo. So, um, and, and I didn't mention it before, but this is Lee's ninth season on the ice. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Dave has been down for seven, so we've got a fair amount of experience between the two of us. Yeah, and then for the, the rest of the other three of us, it's our first time down. And so that next slide shows that's and AWS, this one is out at uh, Williams Field. They call it Willie Field. And actually, we haven't serviced this one yet. Um, I actually went out on a boondoggle with another team to um, some other equipment that was out there and dug a, two giant holes and spent quite a lot of time out there, but actually wasn't even for our project. So that's the AWS um, for our project. Um, then maybe I can have Lee explain some of the equipment that's hanging there and what these AWS do and maybe even like what we're actually supposed to be doing here. Yeah. Um, so Williams Field, this season, we're tra changing how it uh, talks and gets the information out. Currently, uh, you can see a antenna on it that's uh, sort of horizontal. That means it's actually talking directly to McMurdo, and then McMurdo sends it out via the Internet. Uh, that's been kind of not working very well, so we're going to switch it to a satellite transmission. Uh, but starting from top to bottom, you can see the, uh, uh, what looks like a propeller on a, with a white background. Uh, that's actually our, what's called an aerovane. It measures wind speed, wind direction, and then you uh, go down to the next level, and there are two uh, white looking things. Those are temperature sensors and humidity sensors, and they um, are actually stored within radiation shields because you don't want the sun beating directly on those. You want to be able to get good measurements. You don't want the, the, the sun just changing that measurement. Um, going down a step further, you can see the solar panel. That's how we power all of our stations. We use small solar panels and basically car batteries to keep these running uh, year-round and 
sometimes multiple years between visits. And then you can see the large enclosure or box. That's uh, our, uh, where the electronics core is. That's where the pressure sensor is. And the next step down from that is another small temperature sensor because we like to measure temperature at two levels so we can get an idea of how things are changing, if there's anything strange going on with the lowest levels of the atmosphere. And what you don't see there is, is why we have to go service them. So about probably two feet maybe below the surface, there's a big box that has those car batteries he was talking about. And uh, a lot of these areas have a high accumulation of snow. And so um, some of them, like the project we were working on right next to that, the box was about four feet down. So if some of you saw one of my journals that had uh, me standing in a big hole in shirt sleeves, um, uh, we are, we're digging out that box. So basically you dig it out, you put it on the surface, you fill the hole back in, and then um, depending on the height of that tower, you put a new tower section at the top and move all of that equipment up so that it's not buried under the snow anymore. Sorry, I just lost my pictures there. Okay, you still I have there? a question. Yes, we're still here, and there's a, uh, a question that came up. Is the anemometer an RM Young? It looks like the kind on the Mount Washington Observatory. That's actually exactly what it is. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we've, we've got a few different types depending on the area. This is a relatively low wind speed area, and we use the RM Youngs for those areas because they work really, really well. They're very, very robust, and they work at Mount Washington where they get far higher winds than Willie Field will get. Um, in higher wind areas, we've got a specialized one that uh, um, se separates wind speed and wind uh, direction measurements, and it's um, if you look at it, it, it's just a lot of metal and it's very heavy duty, so it can actually stand up to the punishment that Antarctica can deliver. And one more question, just so people know, um, several people joined while you uh, were actually talking. Uh, you guys are in the South Pole in Antarctica, and uh, people want to know what time it is and what day it is. <laughs> okay, so hello from tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it is um, 6, 6, 16 um, on Tuesday morning here. And uh, what was, was that the whole question or was there another bit of that question? Nope, that's fine. We just wanted to give reference to where you, where people are and where you are. Um, I am, we also are on your slide of the weather station. I pointed out all those things. So just tell me when to um, move forward. Yeah, you can move forward. The next picture just shows the lab back at McMurdo uh, where we spend a, a good bit of time. If we're not in the field, we're generally there. Um, okay. So it's been frustrating for some people that we've been communicating with. Did you have a question, Janet? No, it was a classroom uh, feeding back. So just a reminder to people that are joining, please make sure your microphones or phones are muted so we can hear Mike and Lee. Okay, continue, Mike. All right. So. Um, the, the only comment I have there, and it's been frustrating for several classrooms that I've tried to communicate with, is that um, the Internet is, is terrible here. Um, so back in McMurdo, it was terrible there, and, and I thought it was really bad there, but it's even worse sometimes there. So right now we're on a satellite that, here at South Pole that gives us 17% of the allocated bandwidth. Um, but we're only on until about 6.53, I think, was the time when we'll lose it. And then it'll go away. We'll have another box for a few minutes, and then it won't happen again for about 10 hours. Um, in the evening here, the Internet's relatively good. Um, but back at McMurdo, it's just we have it all the time, but it's terrible all the time. And so any of the journals you've seen me post anything on Facebook, that all happens at about 11 o'clock or midnight when enough people have gone to sleep that we have some access to the uh, wet, wet bandwidth available. So anyway, um, that's, that's the picture of what we, where you would see us mostly in McMurdo Station. That next picture 
shows uh, Lee and uh, Elena and Dave um, working on one of the enclosures. Yeah, we were getting this one ready. We were uh, making sure, um, in this picture, we were checking the, uh, the power before we plugged it in. We wanted to make sure it wasn't backwards and we didn't have any problems that way. But every time we get to McMurdo, um, we shift our stations down in advance, and that can vibrate them and shake them apart pretty badly. So every time we get them to McMurdo, we have to check all our con connections, make sure nothing is broken, and you can see sort of that uh, nest of wires. It's basically sorting through those, making sure everything's plugged in well, uh, making sure everything's in good shape, and making sure that it uh, transmits. So we plug everything in, or everything that we have. In this case, it was the box, um, and we, we plugged in the, the data logger, and we plugged in an antenna, and we set it up so it would transmit through the window nearby, and we waited until we got a uh, transmission to the satellite, and we also have a handheld uh, receiver that uh, will basically beep at us when it receives the transmission, so we could know that it, it's in good shape and that it's working. Okay, so all of that stuff happens in preparation for actually going out into the field. So that next picture just shows, uh, that's a Bell 212 that took us to Lori 2, I think, was the um, AWS. Um, so that was interesting. We flew out on this helicopter, which, by the way, is very, very similar to the helicopters I flew in way long time ago. The Army switched, since switched away from those kind of helicopters to what we call Blackhawks now, but um, that Bell 212 is the same thing I flew in 30 years ago. And uh, so we would fly out there. This was interesting because it flew us out about 50 miles or so, and then it left us there. And uh, about eight hours later, maybe not quite that long. About six. Yeah, then, then it came back and picked us up. So that was an odd feeling to be left out maybe 150 miles from anywhere or anything or any living, well, any humans anyway, um, and then, you know, be picked up later. So it was a happy thing to see it come in, and we were looking forward to a nice warm meal after that day. Still there, Janet? Yes, we are still here. Um, and I definitely have uh, some questions that are coming through, um, so you just have to let me know when you're ready to <laughs> answer them. Yeah, I mean, we, we might as well answer some questions now in case we lose this link. We can get as much of that in as possible. Okay, great. Um, so one of the first questions from um, a class um, with Jimmy is, let's see, um, the students want to know, are the, what are some significant weather effects your team has seen at the South Pole, precipitation, change, wind speed, et cetera, in the past decade? Good question. Oh, that's, that's a great question. Um, so we definitely saw the highest recorded temperature ever at South Pole in the last decade. It actually happened a few years ago on Christmas Day, and it got to 10 degrees above zero Fahrenheit. So at its very, very warmest, South Pole is still very cold, um, or can be very cold. Uh, we have seen some interesting blowing snow events, some interesting um, precipitation. Precipitation is very difficult here because it's very dry, it's very cold. So a lot of times uh, you'll actually see just uh, ice grains and snow grains, um, and it's, it's almost hard to tell if it's uh, blowing snow, which is very common, or if it's actually falling from the sky, because a lot of times it will happen when there, it, where there aren't a lot of clouds because the, the air is just so dry that it's difficult to make clouds. So also nearby here, um, Henry and Nico, which are not right here, um, so South Pole Station has its own uh, observations. observations. Our two stations are Henry and Nico, which are maybe 100 miles? About 60 to 70 miles away. Away from here. So one really cool thing about this project is we can, in, in some cases, know exactly what the weather is within about 10 seconds because that station is actually sending data up that we can look at. So it's really nice to know, oh, it's 40 below, so we need to bring 
these clothes as, as opposed to some other clothes. And by the way, I did want to mention I forgot. I mentioned that we were digging in that hole, and it was cold. I, I don't, the wind chill was probably right around zero or so that day. Um, but a lot of kids on the journals asked, why in the world was I and the other fellow, his name is Thomas, why were we in shirt sleeves? And the answer is, um, it's, it's a balancing act to try to be, make sure you don't get sweaty and wet. Um, that's a really bad thing. So. It's, you're constantly taking off clothes, taking off mittens, taking off gloves, coats, and then putting them back on so that your, you know, the sweat can evaporate and you don't get too cold um, without getting too hot. So, yes, the wind chill was right around zero. The air temperature was probably, I don't know, 15 degrees or something maybe. Um, but uh, you wanted to stay dry. So. Um, we're not lying to you. It is not actually 50 degrees and we're out in shirt sleeves. It was actually cold. And it also uh, really helps because the boots they give us are extremely warm. They're, they're designed not necessarily for the relatively warm temperatures of McMurdo where you're above zero. They're, they're more for if you need to work at South Pole in winter and be outside in minus 40, minus 50, all the way down to like minus 70 and minus 80 degrees. Um, so when, you're, when you've got boots and gear that's rated for that cold a temperature and you're working in above zero and uh, close to zero uh, temperatures, it's, it's too warm. You actually will sweat and that can be a big problem. And so to, to follow up on the rest of that, the question that was asked, there are two sites um, a little further east, I think, from here. One is AGO 4, yeah. and uh, we're, somebody is going to install one at AGO 5, which isn't a site yet, which is relatively close to Vostok Station. So in that area is where some of the coldest temperatures ever recorded on Earth have been. And I think one of them was just this past winter. Yeah. Right, at 138 below, something like that? Not quite that cold, because I believe the record currently sits at like 129 below. Um, but yeah, that, that's an area that is consistently just among the coldest on Earth. And actually, it's part of the reason we're in the process of trying to put weather stations in that area, because satellites tell us that there's actually a colder area that isn't really being observed right now and that there's just a pool of cold air sits there over a lot of winters and gets even colder than the record coldest we've seen. So we're trying to verify that with having things on the ground, having instruments actually there rather than just use satellites and see what things are directly at the surface. Uh, but that's a problem because right around that area is also this place called the point of inaccessibility. So these are close to, pretty close to where you're, it's the hardest spot on the continent to actually get to. It's the, the, um, the, the south pole of inaccessibility is the furthest point on Antarctica from water in all directions. So it's, it's a challenge to get to a location like that. All right, so if okay. you just, uh, do you want to do another question or you want to go up to the next picture or what, do you, what would you like to do? Um, actually, the next question I have is related to your next picture, which I'll get back to. Um, it was Pam um, says, hi, Mike. One of my students wants to know if you have gone up the weather tower yet. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's uh, so when we go out, um, we, we all have climbing harnesses. We're all taught how to do that. Um, so yes, I've definitely been up those towers. That picture shows Dave and Alina, though, not me. OK. Yeah, do you want to talk about this picture real quick, since I have it up, about the towers? Sure. Is this Margaret? Uh, no, that is uh, Lori, too. That's Lori, too, also. OK, so this, is, this picture is the in progress. No, I don't have a picture of it. Never mind. So that uh, tower, when we got there, was a good bit seven feet shorter than this. Yeah. Um, and had been buried, and some of the sensors were very close to the snow. So uh, first thing we did when we get there is uh, either Dave or Lee take pictures of it, and then we uh, 
Um, we measure the heights of the instruments because we want to have a good understanding of how much snow has accumulated at the location. And in some cases, we're actually able to measure that with an instrument. But it, this was an older station, so we didn't have that option. Yeah, so then um, the next thing we do is remove all of the equipment um, and dig up that box. So that, that black box there at the bottom, you can see that we've dug, up, dug the area up. So we had to dig down not too far, maybe two feet or so, and find that box. And that box is about a foot deep, maybe. Have to be careful not to cut the cables that run from that box up to some of the equipment. Once all the equipment is off, then two team members climb up, and then uh, two team members will hand up a tower section. They're not really heavy, maybe those 30 pounds or 40 pounds? Usually around 40 pounds. Yeah, so we hand it up. And it, it attaches to the top of that, and then all of that equipment has to be reattached and then reconnected to that enclosure box. Everything gets to be tested again, make sure that we have uh, a connection to their satellites, and then that battery box is connected, and then we fly away. Okay. Awesome. Um, a question that kind of came in that's related. Do you need any special kind of camera equipment to take photos at such low temperatures, or do you need anything special to prepare normal camera equipment to function properly in low temperatures? Um, the, the two biggest issues, and again, depending on the temperatures, uh, the cameras generally do very well, but their battery life can be cut short, so they can uh, you need to be careful about making sure they're charged before you go out in the field. Uh, but actually getting to South Pole, again, because uh, McMurdo is right on the coast, so it can be uh, relatively humid by comparison, and then you fly to South Pole. The first time I came to South Pole, uh, my camera's internal lens uh, got some uh, moisture condensed onto it, and then I got out at the South Pole, and it all froze to it. So for the first uh, day at South Pole, I was unable to take any pictures because everything looked cloudy. Uh, it was just a matter of getting it inside, waiting until it warmed up. And then because, again, South Pole is so incredibly dry, it just all the moisture that it was inside the camera eventually evaporated. But it was uh, a little sad that the first day at South Pole, this was, again, about 10 years ago, uh, I wasn't able to get any pictures from that day. And then I was in a conversation yesterday um, with some other people about this topic. And um, one thing is it's so dry that there's a lot of static. And so um, I heard some stories of people touching their phones and getting a static shock in front of their phone or camera. Um, LCD screens, so like Lee said, as long as you keep your phone warm inside, like inside one of your pockets next to your body, it, it'll work pretty well. Um, although I did notice when we were out um, the other day, my I have a Google Pixel 2, and the LCD, the L stands for liquid, right? So it was, I don't know, windshield was 30 below or something. And uh, my LCD screen started to darken um, because that liquid was freezing. So that scared me. And I put it put it away and didn't, didn't use that anymore. Um, and then somebody else was telling us last night at dinner that their iPhone – um, got really, really cold. It, it didn't ruin the phone, but it wiped the phone. So like all the data was gone, and then they would have needed to get to the iPhone store or, or you know, connect to Apple, which just is not a thing. And yeah, that's not going to happen. You can't do that down here. Uh, and the other thing I heard, and again, similar with batteries, is a lot of people will walk around with their, their cell phone in their pocket. And if you're walking around outside, generally that keeps it warm enough for um, – you're to stay working, but the battery life will be greatly reduced, so you'll walk between buildings, and if it's cold enough, your phone will just shut off. <laughs> and, and especially if you're relying on that for, like, alarms, for appointments and meetings, you'll look at it and end up missing something because, oh, it turned off. Yeah, that's about the only thing my phone's useful for here. I, I take a couple of notes, um, but mostly it's my alarm clock, and other than that, it's useless. Yeah, this is, yeah, we are. We're just like, woo, that's crazy. Um, good good information for future teachers. All right, I have a couple of, uh, there's actually a lot of questions, so I'm going to go back to some of them. Okay, let's um, do that. Yeah, from. We only have a couple of pictures um, left anyway. 
Yeah, from your um, from an elementary school in your area. It says, hi, Mr. Penn. Do you feel the snow or ice move under you, such as a tremor or an earthquake? And Zenon ah, is asking that. I just wrote I just wrote an answer to Zenon. Mrs. Ora sent me this this question. So um, if we get cut okay. off, she, she has the complete answer. So the answer is no, not here. Um, the the rumor is there are places that if that if you listen, you can hear it moving. But here, the, the ice sheet is so thick, 9,300 feet thick, and it moves so slowly, and maybe only, what, a couple of feet a year, maybe, yeah. up here. Um, so no, you don't, you don't feel it happening. But there are places. And, and the kids at my school, of course, have heard all about crevasses, and um, that there are areas where some ice moves slightly faster than other ice. And so at that area, it'll sort of crack open. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know if that was a sufficient answer. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, yeah. there are ice flows that are moving pretty fast, and uh, we've heard of, and again, there are groups that are measuring earthquakes down here and using uh, seismic information to study a lot of things and GPS information to study a lot of things. And actually, uh, those groups have occasionally, they try to find fast-moving ice. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, another another topic that my kids at my school would be familiar with and some of the other kids in the Pittsburgh and Michigan areas that I visited, um, that before we get here, there's a lot of math being done. Um, so each of these AWS, when they are serviced, we take along a really sophisticated uh, GPS system so that we know exactly where it is at that time. And over several visits, maybe over a 10-year period, we'll have three or four positively identified points. And so from that information, we can sort of extrapolate where the, the AWS is going to be when we get there, because it's not where we left it. it it's sliding off the continent. And in some places, it's pretty fast. Uh, I guess maybe Margaret or Lori. Yeah. Basically, if you look at a map of the weather stations and you look at the center of the Ross Ice Shelf, or the, um, which is the bottom of generally those maps um, where most of our weather stations are, uh, the center of it and actually towards the coast of it is actually moving very quickly. You can get uh, um, close to a mile and a little more than a mile of movement in that area. Um, but there are even some much faster areas in West Antarctica that people have put things on and they've come back the next year thinking, oh, we knew exactly where it was, and they actually happened to put it on some really fast-moving ice, and they were completely unable to find that, that system. And they spent days trying, but every so often you'll get caught off guard by just how quickly things can move down here. Yeah, so we can't feel it moving, but it is definitely moving. Yeah. Um, and uh, related, and you might have actually answered this in your question, your response, um, Pam says there's a student, a third grader, that wants to know how deep is the snow where you are, are where you are. Okay, so right here at South Pole, the snow is 9,300 feet deep. So, and that's a little misleading. So, um, there is ground underneath us, and at the North Pole, there's no ground. It's it's water surrounded by land, and here it's land surrounded by water. So there is ground under there, but the, the weight of the ice compresses that ground. Um, and they say right in this area, it's pretty close to, to sea level, the ground under us. Um, and so it's not snow like kids at home in Pittsburgh are thinking about snow, where you know we get a good snowfall or we get two or three feet of snow at home, and uh, you can go dig down to the ground and hit leaves and, and grass. Um, it's 9,300 feet deep, almost two miles. But down about, I don't know, maybe 50 feet or so, that snow gets compressed to where it's actually ice, like ice cubes. Um, and, it's, and it's ice all the way down the remaining two miles. Wow, that's awesome to imagine. Um, Putin Bay School and a few others have similar questions, but they want to know um, how long did it take you to get there? And I'm going to give these in batches. How long did it take you to get there? What kind of supplies did you need to take with you? And then we'll come back to the rest of their questions. Okay, so how long did it take to get here? So from Pittsburgh to Christchurch, New Zealand was 
23 hours of time in an airplane. That's not counting sitting around at different airports in Houston or in Auckland, New Zealand. Then it was another five-hour flight in a C-17 down to McMurdo Station. And then it was another three-hour flight from McMurdo to here. But we did wait for eight days because we had a persistent bad weather that we couldn't fly here. So if that counts in how long, um, we, we sat and waited and waited and waited to get here. Yeah, uh, and, and that's pretty typical uh, that you wait to get here. Bad weather um, here is very different from bad weather back home. So if you're flying in the United States, only generally really bad weather, like blizzards and things like that, will, they can delay planes, but they're not going to delay them for days at a time. You're not going to get canceled for days at a time unless it's a very severe weather system. Here, if you have a real, like the, what was delaying us getting to pole for eight days was um, about 20 mile an hour winds with blowing snow that uh, reduced visibility so you could only see about a mile and a half away from the station uh, or uh, um, a half mile to a mile and a half away from the station. And that's below what the, the planes and pilots and other groups have determined is safe to land because, again, it's not a lit runway. It's, if you, and it's ice. It is landing on <laughs> ice. <laughs> and, when, and when you look down and if you can't see the ground, you, it's very different, difficult to tell what the surface of the ground is like. And if you're landing on snow and ice, if you're in the wrong area and you're not landing on a runway, which they've taken the time to flatten out, you're landing on very bumpy ice, and that can be very damaging to a plane. Yeah. So visibility, more than anything else down here, is what keeps you from flying. And so all of my kids would be familiar with uh, the flat white. And so for a pilot, when they're coming down, descending to land on the ground, if they can't tell where the ground is, even if their instruments tell them that it's 10 feet below them, if they can't see it, that's a really dangerous situation. And so um, just to prevent the, the danger, they don't fly or often they'll boomerang, they'll get up in the air and then the, the weather deteriorates and they have to come back. Uh, that happens quite a lot. Yeah, we've seen that more, more often this year than I've seen in past years. Um. There's been several questions about what animals have you seen, or if any. <coughs> yeah, so um, we have seen, I saw two school of birds. Um, they did not attack me. Kids will be happy to hear. Um, and then we saw one tiny little bird out in the middle of nowhere, miles and miles from anywhere. I think it was an Antarctic uh, petrel. So it's a small bird that was just, that was at uh, our Lori 2 site visit came out of somewhat nowhere and just started circling us. And often uh, birds and other animals, like it's, cause it's mostly birds down here, so penguins and uh, petrels, they'll be interested because they don't see a lot of things like people, so they're curious about what's going on. So they'll fly over, circle us, see what we've got, see if we have some food they might like, because that's mainly what they're doing. Um, and we're not, we're not supposed to feed them, we're not allowed to feed them, so we don't feed them. <laughs> but the same thing will happen with a lot of uh, animals down here. Is they'll wander over and be curious about what you are because they don't see a lot of things like us. Um, we've also, uh, outside of McMurdo, there are always a few seals in the uh, cracks right by the water on the sea ice that are just sitting and sunning themselves this time of year. So they don't move a whole lot, but they just sort of sit, hang out, and sunbathe for a good amount of the, the summer. Yeah, most of those seals just completely ignored us. Every now and then they'd sort of roll over and look at us, but other than that. Um, and we didn't get real, real close. When we were walking through those pressure ridges, there was one point where we got within about 15 feet, and that was by accident. We wouldn't have normally done that, um, but that was the only safe route from where we were to where we were going, um, and that was kind of a dangerous area, so we had to stay right there. And, and that seal never even moved. He, he, was just, he or she was just asleep, and, and we walked past, and that was it. Um, I have your so photo of the... Oh, I, I, have I, your I, photo. I did see one penguin. Sorry. Oh, I do have your uh, photo with the seals in the background so that they had that. Okay. Yeah. 
you know, we did um, see one penguin. We went over to Scott Base, and so out the window, the rumor was there was one out there, and I couldn't see it, but I took a picture anyway. And then later, I zoomed way in, and you can, if you use your imagination, I, and I think I posted that picture in one of the journals, um, if you use your imagination and squint a little bit, you can kind of tell there's a penguin there. Okay, we have some questions that are, that are related to kind of living there. Um, there was a question earlier about what kind of food do you eat? Uh, some, another school wants to know what do you do for fun? And another school wants to know what happens if there's a medical emergency. So food, fun, and emergencies. Okay, the food's great, actually, um, and there's plenty of it when we're in station. When we're not in station, though, um, it's generally your responsibility to take care of yourself. So back in the galley, they have uh, food set aside for field teams, but you kind of have to assemble it yourself and take it with you. So, and it, this occurred to me uh, last night. I was watching some of the videos that I had posted, and almost every picture that shows me holding my GoPro and circling around so everybody can see the horizon, my mouth is working. And it's because the only time that I can take those pictures is when I'm eating. I've gone back to my bag and I'm eating something. So uh, otherwise, I'm doing some work somewhere. So I apologize. It did occur to me I'm always chewing when, <laughs> when I'm on those videos. Um, OK, so food was one. The food, is, food here at South Pole is really good. Um, and the style of food here is very similar to uh, cafeteria, so yeah. hot, hot lunch. Just they try to make it a little bit better and more variety, and they do a very good job with the limited ability, like limited uh, food they have. Yeah, and it's definitely a morale thing here to keep people happy and looking forward to something coming up um, because it's a very small space. You're stuck inside. I mean, you can go outside, but you can't get far away and you can't be out long. So. Um, it's kind of like being on a ship. Uh, fun. What do you do for fun? Okay. And then, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fun is limited, really. Um, so everybody, everyone is aware when the Internet here is available. So uh, it's funny, lately dinner, the, the Internet comes up on at about 6.45-ish. Um, and that slides every day a little earlier, actually, right now. but. Um, as soon as that happens, about two thirds of the people in the caf in the galley get up and, and leave, and <laughs> they're they're going for their computers to email home. So uh, there is a there's a there's a room that has a pool table and there there's a there are pool tables there there's a gymnasium for basketball workout rooms. Um, they also have uh, card tournaments like uh, cribbage is a very big game down here. Um, same with as is euchre. Um, we uh, they also have um, craft nights um, and science talks and uh, various lectures, travel logs. So people talk about travels they've done, and you get a, a lot of information. And you also can, but uh, one of the things I always recommend to everyone that's coming down, bring books with them because uh, especially when you're spending eight days waiting to get somewhere, you have um, you need you need something to do when you run out of work to do, waiting for a flight. So reading is a big part of it for me. Um, yeah, me too. Yeah. In fact, we both brought books down here while we were waiting to get on, waiting for the internet to get on. Okay. So food, okay. fun. What was the last one? Okay. Emergency. Um, oh, emergency. Medical yeah, emergency. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, emergencies. Okay. So there is a doctor here, and there's a PA, so a physician's assistant, um, in station. But they, they're very limited in what they can do. They could stabilize somebody if they were severely injured. But we are 3,800 miles from a hospital. And so if there's a really, really bad problem, it doesn't look good. Um, so all of us had to go through um, what's called a PQ uh, test. And so to get to South Pole, and this is something I noticed almost immediately, South Pole is much younger than McMurdo Station. People are generally more fit here. That's not to say everyone's young and everyone's fit, but in general, um, and I am—I am—I bet you within 
I'm in the top three of oldest people on the station. If not, it's hard to tell sometimes how old people are. Okay. So did I answer um, that sufficiently? Uh, yes, you did. So uh, another um, uh, student is asking, since you have 24 hours of light during certain times of the year, does the team utilize more solar power for the equipment, or is the amount of sunlight not enough to provide sustainable energy? That's Lee's question. Actually, yes. The, the uh, solar power, for we, depending on where you are in Antarctica, uh, we'll, you'll either have six, like if you're at South Pole, you will have six months of consistent, great solar power. Uh, as you get uh, um, basically slightly north of here, it get, you get a little bit more, and that's sufficient to charge our batteries, and the batteries are there not necessarily to run the station uh, during the summer. The solar panel, panel provides more than enough power to run the equipment during the southern months and provide uh, a recharge to the batteries. The batteries are there so when the sun sets and you're now in 24 hours of darkness, you, uh, the batteries kick on and they start to power the system for uh, the, those months where it's completely dark. So that's why we raise the battery system and constantly check on it because we don't want to get in the situation where it's the winter months when we can't get down here. So um, southern hemisphere winter being in around July and we can't get down here and then we lose three, four, five months of information because the, the station is on. So yes, the solar panel is how we provide power year round despite the fact that the sun is only up for about six months. And Janet, just so you know, we have nine minutes of, it, of uh, satellite coverage. Okay, great. Uh, I have just a few more quick questions. I've already told everybody else that we will email you all of the questions, and then you can respond to them in a journal as well. Um, okay, there was um, somebody wanted to ask, uh, Putin Bay School says, how old are those weather stations? Since I have a weather station up, let's answer that. So it depends on the weather station. You, we showed a picture of Lori 2. That was one of the older style weather stations. So we've gone through a number of different versions of weather stations. Uh, that one, uh, the first version of that weather station was built in 1979. And that particular weather station has been installed since the uh, late 80s to early 90s. I believe it was installed in 1989. So that one has been in for a long time. Um, some of our newer stations are as young as they've been installed last year or two years ago. And some are on the list to be installed this year. That's right, yes. And, and Forbes in our group is working on the new design for a system that, so we'll move to the next thing and uh, install those and those will be brand new. Yeah, so that picture that he was referring to and the one we looked at earlier that has uh, Elena and Dave up on that tower, that's, like he said, that's an older one. And um, just as evidence of how old it is, it looks like it's tilted in the picture. It actually is tilted. And so evidently the, the deeper ice may be moving slightly faster than the ice on the top on the surface. And it sort of uh, puts the tower at an angle and actually that's, becoming a problem um, because, right, if the, if the snow sensor is, is judging snow depth, um, and, and if it's not perpendicular to the ground, you don't get an accurate re measurement. If it's angled a little bit, you get the hypotenuse of that triangle and you don't get the, the perpendicular leg of that right triangle. And so at some point, those will have to be uh, Re replaced. Yeah, right. basically we'll dig down as much as we can, recover the tower sections, and then install it again and make sure it is uh, level straight up and down and in good shape because they slowly tilt over time and the older stations tilt slightly more. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't want to lose you and just have you cut off. So I am uh, coming, to, I came to our thank you slide, and I really want to thank you for um, joining us today. I'm so glad that Mike and Lee were able to connect with us. Um, if you didn't get yeah, your question. Yeah, we didn't question, think that was going to happen. I know, I know, who knew? 
Um, if you didn't get your questions answered, please post them on the journal. And of course, we'll share all the questions uh, that came uh, to us today with Mike so he can respond to them. Um, Mike and Lee, um, we have lots of thank yous going on. Uh, the Earth Science class says thank you. Jimmy says thank you. And um, it was a great event. So we'll post it online so people can um, access it later, too. Um, so, uh, Mike and Lee, before we close here, what, what are, what's your next step? What's happening next? So, we are currently waiting on uh, the Twin Otter plane to fly from McMurdo to South Pole so we can get to our two stations. So, that Twin Otter was the airplane you saw in the, in the back of one of those pictures. Yeah. Um, and so, unfortunately, until that arrives, we are uh, in a holding pattern. We're waiting for <laughs> with not a not a lot to do. So, uh, my my next step is probably to sign up to help uh, wash dishes. Right? Yeah, that was on my list of stuff to do too. We uh, decorated the Christmas area, and we have house mouse duties, and uh, there will be some things to do. Very good. Well, we hope that, uh, you know, things don't get too behind and that you're able to leave when you, um, or at least close to when you uh, anticipate leaving. And it, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I know my wife is listening right now. That's not likely to happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, um, if people that are participating want to open their mics and say hello, goodbye, um, at least they'll, they can hear your voices. And again, thank you, Mike and Lee, for joining us today. Thanks, Mike.